All right, a lot of great truths in Psalm 39. Let's dig right in with verse number one. The Bible reads, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. And this concept of uh, taking heed to your ways that you sin not with your tongue is a very, 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 very important uh, one to be thinking about and mindful of probably every single day of our lives. And I'm going to be turning to a few other passages. We've gone over this before. If you want to keep your place here in Psalm 39, flip back to Psalm 17. Uh, we went through this. I, I don't remember exactly how far in depth I went into this. Probably pretty far in depth because uh, it's such an important topic to just be mindful about and to bring up regularly. If you think about sinning with your tongue, so you know, Psalm 39, 1 said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. Taking heed to your ways means you're paying attention to what you're doing. You know, it, not sinning with your tongue doesn't happen by accident or by chance. You have to have a concerted effort to not sin with your tongue. And I quickly just jotted down right before service a few sins that you do with your tongue. And this isn't meant to be comprehensive. There's just so many ways that you can sin with your mouth. I mean, first of all, just think of like lying, right? When you tell a lie, it's probably one of the most common things. When you just say something that's not true, it's a lie, that's a sin. How about railing on people? And we're going to get into that a little bit. We're going to turn to James 3 in just a few minutes. Um, and we're going to see just the, the you know, cursing and, and all the things that you can do with your tongue and all the problems you can cause and all the iniquity you could stir up with your tongue. Blaspheming the Lord is another sin. How about gossiping and slander and tail bearing and all these various things you do with your mouth? And you know what? They're very, very, very easy to do as well. It's easy to let your mouth slip, which is why we need to take heed to our ways that we're not sinning with our tongue. Psalm 17 Verse number three, the Bible says, Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in a night, thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing. And th this latter portion is the part where we'll focus on, I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Similar concept. We need to be purposed. It needs to be something that you think about regularly that you're not going to sin with your mouth because it's so easy to do. And when we read all these, thing, all these, these truths in the scripture about sinning with your mouth, these days, you can equally apply sinning with your mouth with sinning on social media, right? Your, your mouth is just what, what are you projecting? What are you putting forth, right? What's coming from you? And, you know, whether it be literal words physically coming out of your mouth or whether you're typing those same words, you know, on a phone or on a keyboard or whatever and sending out whatever it is you're saying, it's the same rules are going to apply. You know, we need to take heed to our words, what we're saying, because those same sins that is lifted, listed off as well as other sins can all be done by virtue of typing just as easily as they could be done by speaking with your mouth. And everyone's agreement that is pretty much common sense, but sometimes I feel like I just need to bring it up, especially in, in, in areas where I think those types of sins uh, happen even more frequently than they do, you know, in the, the virtual world, they seem to happen much more frequently than they do in real life as far as, you know, the physical. Now, don't get me wrong, they happen in both a lot. But this, there's so many, and I'm not going to get into all the social media stuff and all the reasoning why it's easy to do, but it is easy to do. The anonymity, people are, are a little bit more bold when you're not confronted face to face with somebody and you end up saying things that you might not even normally say just for out of courtesy because some people still have manners and respect and, and will refrain themselves where you're physically in the presence of someone that you wouldn't normally say, you know, that, that, um, that you shouldn't say. But nowadays when you're not in the presence with the people, it's a lot easier to say. Even in the Bible, we had that happening when the Apostle Paul was talking about, hey, you know, there's these guys among you that are saying, dude, basically talking all this trash, and I'm totally paraphrasing, this is like the message version, right? Where they're talking a bunch of trash about me and we'll see you know how how hard their talk is when i when i show up you know their, their words are weighty and real powerful you know and they're saying this about paul yeah when he's out there he could talk real tough and stuff well we'll see how he is when he shows up and he's like yeah you will see how it is when i show up right because that's the way people are you know they like to to backbite and, and rail and and talk the big game 
when the people aren't there, but then when they actually are face to face, they don't say as much. And that's, that's the same principle that I'm applying here to with, with, that happens online all the time where people wouldn't normally say this stuff in someone's presence, but it's a lot easier to say it online. So we need to be purpose. Everyone needs to be purpose because look, this is something that's easy to fall into. I mean, just think about gossip. Just talking about stuff that's not your business, talking, what, you know, well, this person did this thing and that person did that thing and, and all the juicy news and all this stuff that, look, if it's not good for the use of edifying, if, it's not, if there's none of your business, if there's no point to it, if it's just completely vain, you know, that's gossip. Amen. Now, sometimes it's important to understand if someone has done wrong to some, you know, like there's, there's definitely a lot of situations where that may be possible, but... Let's not get caught up in just talking about what everyone else is getting into and doing and stuff. Look, it's none of your business. It doesn't matter to you, right? If it doesn't matter to you, then, then don't go uh, running your mouth about people. Verse, uh, Psalm 39.1 continues there when he says, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. And that's the second part of this. You know, we need to just make sure we don't sin with our tongue. But even on top of that, then, we need to make sure that we're keeping our mouth under control while the wicked is before me. You know, not only do we just not want to sin against God or sin against some other people, right? Because that's bad enough as it is just getting involved in sin. But when the wicked's before us, they're going to take what we say and use that against us. So when we get involved in sin and, and slander and gossip and tailbearing and all this other stuff, and the enemy hears that and the wicked hears that, they're going to be like, oh, I thought you were Mr. Christian. I thought, you know, and whatever it is, whether, you know, you're using language as an approach, you know, whatever, whatever it is, people are going to use that against you because they're scrutinizing you. And that's why you need to, to keep your mouth like with a bridle. And the bridle's talking about, you know, you put bits in the horse's mouths. And turn if you, know, turn if you would to James chapter 3 anyways. Let's just go there. You have to put these things in animals' mouths because you're trying to control them and, it, and, it's, and it's not allowing them to do certain things. It's like, you know, putting a gag on someone, right? Because <laughs> it's practically what we need to do. Now, obviously, we need to talk, but, you know, this is using language to be able to, to control that. So wh while the wicked is before me, we need to make sure... And, and, and dead make sure that we're not going to get involved in just saying a bunch of stupid things. The Bible says in Proverbs 10, 19, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. In the multitude of words, there wanteth, wanteth means there doesn't lack. So the more, and just be sure of this, the more that you just talk and 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 talk, and talk the more likely there is that you're going to say something sinful. It's, it's the way it is. That's what, the, that's what the Proverbs is teaching there. And the multitude of words are wanting not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Amen. And we live in a day today, in a culture today, where everybody needs to give their opinion. Everyone needs to tell you, right? Did you hear about this? And it's this gossip mentality, and it's gone crazy. And, it, and again, I'm, I'm thinking this is what happens online all the time, yeah. where people just... Oh, did you see this happen? It's all the comments. So just comment, 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 comment. Like, no one cares. That's right. <laughs> really. The only people who care are the other gossipers. By and large. I mean, look, I'm not saying it's wicked or wrong to make a comment on a post or a video or something like that. That's not what I'm saying. But you know what I'm talking about, that there's people that just, I'll tell you what, that one comment may not be a sin, but the people are just commenting, 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 commenting all the time. Multitude of words are wanted, not sin. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so the wise thing to do, smart thing to do, show some restraint. You don't need to always give your opinion on everything Amen. all the time and just comment on everything because that's not a wise thing according to Scripture. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2, the Bible says, Be not rash with thy mouth. Rash just means you're not, you're not giving any thought. You're, you're not, you're doing it real quickly, right? Where you just, just spout off whatever comes, comes to your mind. It's just coming right out of your mouth. We ought to have a filter. So the Bible says, be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. There again, just like in Proverbs, 
The multitude of words are one that not sin. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5.3, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. We need to learn how to just keep a lid on it. And, you know, if you, um, if this is a hard thing for you, you have a problem with this, I know of someone who has, who has rules set up where they limit how long they have, you know, even conversations for. And I think that's a great idea to just kind of keep tabs of going, you know, if I've been talking for 30 minutes, that may not be, you know, like just go, without having anything intentionally to like talk about, right? I mean, we have something to talk about, you, you know, we're like we're, we're catching up on people on a prayer list or something and you're talking about how this person's doing. That's different than just hanging out. Oh, okay, blah, blah, blah. You know, you just talk. and Because you know what? The longer you just let that mouth go and go and go, the more likely you are to get to, to have sin, right? So, and this, look, this is wisdom. This is what the Bible is teaching us to be wise. And James 3 is where I had you turn. The Bible gives an excellent description of our tongues, of our mouths, and amount of damage that can be done with our mouth, which is why it's so important, like Psalm 39 says, I'll take heed to my ways, I sin not with my tongue. Because what comes out of your tongue, you can't take back. Just like actions you do, any sins that you do, you can't just go and take those things back. You can't undo that. And the things that you say, you can't take it back. Once it's out of your mouth, it's gone. So be careful when the thought is in your head, what you release because it's, it's out there. And, and nowadays, even more so with the internet, you put something online, it's out there forever. There is no, there's no, there's no forgetting either. See, when you say something out of your mouth, you can't take it back. But over time, people can forget. The problem with the internet now is that you just go back. You just go way back machine. And you just find pretty much whatever you want. And then you've got other people, because you know they're out there, that are just taking shots of everything that you say and do and everything. You know what? You might as well just expect. You'd be like, no one cares about what I say. You know what? You might as well just live your life as if someone is just taking screenshots of every single thing that you put up online ever. Because that's how the internet works. It's out there. It's out there for good. And I'll tell you what. Data storage is real cheap these days. And there's very little data contained in those, in those pictures and in those... Uh, words that you put out there. So I'm telling you, you know, if you, if you, if you take anything from tonight's sermon, please, please put a filter on the words that come out of your mouth and let your words be few because you don't need to have a huge multitude of words. James chapter three, look at verse number one, the Bible reads, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. So if you're not able to, I mean, look, it's, it's inevitable we're going to offend people. Because that's what words do. If you're, saying, if you're able to not offend in word, you're a perfect man, you're able to control your whole body. So another important point here is that, you know, controlling your mouth will help control your actions as well. You say, I don't know how the two are linked. Well, it doesn't matter if you even understand how the two are linked because the Bible's telling us that it's gonna, it works that way. And, and you know, it goes on for a little bit further to say in verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. So you've know, you got a horse, and you, you notice that the, the bridle goes in and goes in through their mouth, and you can steer one way or the other and kind of direct their head this way or that way. And the control is coming from their jaw and from their mouth, and it's turning them um, one way or the other. And we are similar in the sense that if you can control and have the ability to be temperate, to control what's coming out of your mouth, because that, that comes out first, even bef usually before you react, then you can control your actions as well. If you have the ability to control your mouth and things that you say, then you definitely should have the ability to control how you act and, and the actions that you perform. But look at verse number four. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So um, verse six says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. 
so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. The Bible says the tongue is a world of iniquity and you know it just takes a little bit, just a little spark, a little bit of fire to cause a lot of damage, to do great evil uh, just by, you know, and, and that can be caused by the things that you say. You know, you can end up saying things that damage relationships, that, that do hurt unto people. You know, I know they're just words. Words are powerful. I mean, think about how powerful words are. Words, the, the words of the Lord are able to save the soul. Jesus Christ is the word of God. Think about the power in the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged two -edged sword, the Bible says. So, so God's word is extremely powerful. You know, our words aren't as powerful, but you know what? Our words are still powerful. Our words still have an impact on people. You have, you have the power to encourage people and strengthen people and, and, and lift people up with your words. Even without your actions, your words alone are able to do some good. Even the, the false prophets, when they said, peace, peace, they were able to comfort the people a little bit just with their words. Now, their words were empty and vain and meaningless and lies. So in the end, you know, the people are still going to suffer. But even their words were able to do something because words are powerful. Let's continue reading here in James 3, verse number 7. The Bible says, For every be kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. You know, we're able to take these various beasts and, and tame them, right, and control them. The Bible says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom." But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. We're almost done here with James 3. Uh, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The reason why I kind of just read through the rest of this chapter here is I want to show you from maybe a little bit of a higher level without going verse by verse, um, the contrast between the, the, the evil and the bitter, the envying, the, the wrath, the strives versus um, the peaceable, the gentle. And he's saying, you know, out of your mouth, you shouldn't have both things proceeding out of your mouth. You should have goodness, gentleness. Now, look, we all know when you take the Bible in as a whole that there is a time to curse somebody. The Apostle Paul said, let them be accursed, right? And the Bible says not to bid people Godspeed in 1 John, that's, that's or um, 3 John, where, where, you know, people who are out and preaching a false gospel you know, not to, not to bid them Godspeed because you're a partaker of their evil deeds. So there are certain times where your language is appropriate. There's times for rebuke. There's, there's times where that's necessary. And that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about where, you know, um, you're just full of cursing and wrath or these things are just coming out of you, out of your flesh, right? And they're not, it's not a righteous indignation, something that would be, um, uh, righteous according to scripture and you know we ought not to have our tongues so far out of control that we just have this sweet water and bitter and, and you've got kind of both going on there we need to be able to control that and control our mouths um, so that way we can be full of the spirit and have the wisdom that's from above that's pure peaceable gentle easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy that's the, the, the spirit that should dictate how we speak Let's go back to Psalm 39, because I, I could spend all day just talking about that. The 
But there's a lot of great uh, truths in here. Verse number two, the Bible reads, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred. So the Bible obviously is talking about, you know, let your words be few and, and it's wise not to just to just go overboard. But um, we need, again, take it for, for the meaning, for what it says, for the point it's trying to get across and don't too broadly or over apply what the Bible's teaching with letting your words be few. Because obviously there's a lot of good things you can do with your mouth too. So you're not just supposed to be a mute and just not speak at all. It's a warning letting you know that, hey, if you don't keep tabs on what you're saying, you're, you, know, you kind of let yourself just go, there's going to be sin. But at the same time, it's not that we should just put duct tape on our mouths and never say anything, right? That, that's going too far. And here we're saying, you know, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good. You know, we want to get to the point where we're keeping our peace and holding our silence even from saying good things and doing good things with our mouth, right? It's not a... That's not the point. And the Bible says, and my sorrow was stirred. So we need to be using our mouth, using our lips, using our tongue to do the right thing from good things. And when, because when we're not doing good, that's going to bring you sorrow. And we're not speaking good. He said, my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. And, you know, the, the Holy Spirit's, you know, you're saved, you're born again. The Holy Spirit's going to stir you up. It should be stirring you up to, to speak good and to speak right and to speak encouragement and to speak edifying and to speak the word of the Lord. And hopefully you feel that burning. Uh, you can turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 20. We just looked at this reference, this verse, not that long ago in one of another recent sermons, this passage in Jeremiah 20 where Jeremiah is explaining the same exact feeling here of, of not speaking, holding his mouth, even from the good, and then having that burning within to just, you got to speak, you got to say something. In verse number seven of Jeremiah tw uh, 20, the Bible reads, O Lord, thou hast deceived me and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I and has prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me in a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. Just say, you know what? I'm done with this. People are just mocking me. They're making fun of me. They don't want to hear this. You know, so I just won't, I just won't say anything anymore. No, I'm not going to do it. But then the verse continues, says, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. He's saying, it, just, it was just too much for me. Right? It's too much to keep silence. I had to say something. And we need to balance this desire and need to have to say and to preach the right things and to preach the truth with letting ourselves go overboard and just want, you know, there's no sin wanting because you just keep rambling and rambling and rambling. Hey, as a preacher, it's a hard job. Right? You've got to make sure that I don't just stand up here and just start rambling and rambling. And you're like, Pastor Burns, I know, please. Don't start rambling because in the, in the abundance of words are want is not sin. Now, obviously, when you're teaching on things, there's, there's so many instances where, you know, words are necessary and you're going to be speaking for a long period of time. You're giving the gospel to someone. It could, it could take you an hour to give someone the gospel and help them understand. There's obviously not, not sin coming out of your mouth when you're teaching, instructing on things that are good and you're focused on something like that. I brought that up before, but it's, it's that mindless chatter where you start off with just like, oh, it's a nice day today. And look, there's nothing wrong with saying it's a nice day today. But when you really got nothing to talk about and nothing really to say, but you just keep talking anyways just to fill the space, that's when you're going to not be lacking in the sin department after a little while because the, it's, the, it's the idleness that ends up taking over and you end up just talking about things that you shouldn't be talking about. Um, but yeah, this, this, uh, this, this not holding your peace when you have good to preach, right? That obviously, God wants us out there. We're supposed to be preachers of righteousness um, and, and doing the right thing. And the Bible even says, you know, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So that by not speaking sometimes, you know you need to give someone the gospel. You know someone's not saved. You know you ought to be doing that. You, you know you ought to be 
whatever it is, doing whatever good that the Bible commands us to do, if you don't do it, that even that's a sin. You say, yeah, but I didn't do these other things that you said not to do. Yeah, but you need to do the things that God said to do as well. And God has made us ambassadors uh, for the cause of Christ. Let's keep reading here in, in uh, Psalm 39, verse number four. The Bible says, Lord, make me to know mine end in the measure of my days what it is that I may know how frail I am. And, and this is a, you know, a great verse in the desire to maintain humility. He's saying, Lord, he's asking, Lord, make me to know my end and the, you know, the, basically the measure of my days, the length of my days. Help me understand that, that I have a time that's coming where it's going to end and, and when that is, just so I can know how frail I really am. Because we don't want to get a big head thinking that we're so strong and mighty and you, know, you could have a lot of victories, things are going well, and just think you're invincible and you can do anything and start getting a real proud heart and a proud attitude because you know what? We all have an end. And there's a day that's coming and you don't have to turn over in James 4. The Bible says in verse 13, Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. We need to understand that we're here for a very short time. We understand that our days are few and that no matter how, you know, you, you may feel real strong one day, but you know what? That changes real fast, real fast. And under, just having that understanding and knowing, you know what? Man really is frail. And, uh, you know, all it takes is, is one slip, one, before you realize, I mean, there's a lot of things that God made. I mean, God made us amazing in the bodies that we have. And there's a lot of great resiliency and ability to handle diseases and all kinds of other things and wounds and the healing nature that God has put into our bodies and all the mechanisms that are there. It's truly a wonder and magnificent and, and amazing what people can even go through. But at the same time, with, with all of that, those great strengths of how God made us, I mean, you can literally slip and fall down and die tonight. Just hit your head the wrong way. Whatever, you know, just freak accident. It can happen. When you live day to day and nothing seems to happen, it has a tendency to embolden you and, uh, you know, has a potential to, to make you become too proud. We don't want to be proud. We'd be thankful for the time that we have, thankful for the breath that you have, thankful for the health that you have, thankful for everything, always knowing, hey, you know, we have an end. There's a day and we're frail. We're not as strong as we necessarily think we may be. Um, and all the more reason to rely on the Lord. Verse number five in Psalm 39 says, Behold, thou hast made my days as in handbreadth. And handbreadth is like nothing. It's the width of your hand. It's just, it's a very, very, very short period of time. And mine age is as nothing before thee. No matter how old you live, your age is as nothing before God. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. And I think this is important in understanding this humility that's brought up. I mean, we're only in verse five. I know I preach for a while kind of really going in depth on, you know, verse number one, especially and looking at other passages. But when we're talking about taking heed to our ways to not sin with our mouth. Having a humble heart and a humble attitude is greatly going to help you in that endeavor. It really is. Because the humble mind is going to esteem others better than yourself. When you esteem others better than yourself, you're not always out there going, yeah, everyone needs to listen and hear what I got to say. Because you more have a mindset of what can I do to help you? Not everyone listen to me. I'm the boss. Everyone do what I say. Right? And even just, I mean, what about people just, when, when you keep talking and talking and talking and talking and talking, what do you know the most about? You know the most about yourself. Hopefully, or maybe you know, hopefully you don't know the most about everybody else, but you're going to be talking, when you're talking a lot, you're just going to be talking about yourself all the time. And that's kind of a conceited attitude to have of just going on and on and on and on and on and on and on talking about yourself. So one of the ways that you can keep yourself from getting involved in, you know, and being able to keep your mouth is having this humble attitude, this humble heart. And that's why we see this here in Psalm 39 saying, hey, my days are like a handbreadth, my age is nothing, and verily every man has best state is altogether vanity. And it's an extreme statement, but we see some of the similar things in Ecclesiastes. Turn if you go to Ecclesiastes chapter one. 
I'm going to read verse 6 here. It says, Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. Basically, it's talking about our life. Just, just, there's a lot of vanity in this life. And really, every, just about everything is vanity that's not for the Lord, that's not doing something for God. And there's a lot of time that we have on this earth that's spent in vain things. And even us with, you know, those of us with the best intentions of wanting to use our time, there's still a lot of vanity kind of wrapped up into our lives. Um, and, and when we understand that, it should help you to have more humility of your mind and have the right attitude towards the Lord and uh, get your heart right. Ecclesiastes 1.1 1, 1 says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. So again, talking about our days, it's like nothing before God. Hey, the generations come and go, and you're just part of one generation, and the generations come and come and come. Is the earth still here? And the people, you just come and go and come and go and come and go, and it's kind of like, who are we? Right? Who am I? among all this, among all these people, among this great earth and everything else that God made. Who are we? Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 17, Paul reads, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. Now this is after, the, you know, Solomon is writing here about, in chapter 2, he just goes on and on about all the stuff that he's done. I mean, he's done all these great works, has had all these accomplishments, right? He's built all these things, these gardens and just whatever, right? That's whatever he wanted to do, He's out there. He has the resources to do all this stuff. He's got the capital. He's got the means. He's got the workers. He's got people there to just basically any project that he wants to get done, he's getting them done. And we all know that when you, when you work hard, there's some satisfaction in, in getting things done and getting jobs done. But Solomon's just saying, you know, at the end of the day, it's vanity. Right? You can have some satisfaction getting a job done, but then if you, when you really start to think about it on the big scale of things, it's like, cares, right? I mean, you think about all the projects you do at home, like, oh man, yeah, I fixed this. I just leveled our stove the other day and I'm all like excited, like, let me know how it works, honey, because there's always just, there's always just things just running down to the end of the pan. And you know, I don't cook, so it's, doesn't, it's not a big deal for me, but I know it's been bothering her for a long time. So here, and you know, this is my, this is part of my rambling. I watch it. So I take all this, all this pride and going like, oh man, this is great. I did this for you. I took the time and I got this fixed. And now I want to know. But at the end of the day, you know what? Does it really, really matter that much? No. No. And, you know, it's just part of, there's one glimpse into how I spent part of my day earlier this week. But, um, and that's one part that in the end is not going to mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Right? So we have a lot of that. And, you know, we can't just focus on all that. And, that. and that was what, you know, you read all of Ecclesiastes to get the whole thing in context here to understand. We need to have the understanding that, you know, a lot of the things that we may think are important really aren't important and put it all in the right perspective. But it's not meant to, to be, a, a, you know, something to just bring you down and just be like, oh, man. Like, like Solomon's recounting here how he was depressed. He was just getting sad. of just like, man, this is all just, just meaningless and empty. There is meaning in the end. You got to read it all the way to the end and get, and get the full picture, right? But it, the, the point of all this is to explain not to get caught up in the vanity and let your life be all about those things and that stuff that's out there in the world on how you could be spending your time. That's right. The Bible says in, in, in Ecclesiastes 2.18, Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. So you're saying like, no matter how much I build and work and, and save up and, and, and wealth and everything I accumulate, it's just going to be left to someone after me. It doesn't even matter who that person is. I mean, if it's a, if it's a son or someone else, like, like that stuff that you did is going to go to someone else. And he's saying, hey, I know I was wise with my stuff, but what, they could just be a fool with it and they could just, just blow it all and it's all gone. And eventually that will happen. <laughs> that is always what happens eventually. It may not happen in the first generation or whatever or the second, but that's always what happens. It always just comes 
to nothing. And just like in Psalm 39, verse 6, it says, Surely every man walketh in a vain show, surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. Right? Who's going who's gonna to have it after you're gone? And does it really matter? Because heaping up the riches on this earth isn't what this life is all about. Back in Psalm 39, verse number 7, the Bible says, And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. So he's kind of taking stock of, of things here, talking about the vanity in life and just saying, well, what good is all these riches? Heaping up riches, not knowing who's going to have them. And he's saying, well, what do I wait? What, why am I still, uh, what, what do I wait for? Lord, my hope is in thee. We're trusting in God. He says, deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. Lord, I don't want to be the, the, the laughing stock, the butt of, of foolish people. The fools out there are making me a reproach. In verse 9, he says, I was dumb, I opened not my mouth, because thou didst it. And we also need to make sure that we learn this, of not opening up our mouths against the Lord. See, when God's chastening you and God's disciplining you, we need to make ourselves dumb and open not our mouth because he did it. Right, when, you got, when you got some disciplining coming, and that's what he says um, in verse 10, remove thy stroke away from me, I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. You know, when we sin... When we do things that are, that are bad, he's delivered me from all my transgressions. He did wrong, right? Watch your mouth against, of speaking against the Lord. Bad things may happen to you. Well, you know what? Maybe you deserve it. Maybe, right? There's obviously a lot of different reasons why things happen in this life. There's even people who do bad things to you, that God allows certain things to happen to you. It's not always because of what you do, but you know what? I try to live my life treating just about everything bad that happens as if I'm responsible for that. And you know what that's going to do? It's going to help keep you humble. Now, that may not be the case, but you know what? That may help me just get even closer to God then. If it wasn't because of something I did, okay, it still happened. I'm not going to get mad at God for it. And I'm just going to use that then, even if it had nothing to do with, with my own sins, to still try to get right with God because... You're never perfect. So I'm going to say, man, well, I better do this or I better do that or, you know, whatever. And have that type of a mindset because you don't want to go the other direction of having, you know, well, why do you do this, God? And start opening up your mouth against the Lord and, uh, and, having, and, and allowing yourself to get puffed up. Verse number um, 11, when thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, Thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. So again, we're seeing that this is, he's talking about not opening his mouth because God is correcting someone from their sin with rebukes. He's saying, and he's saying, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. And remember that too, that, you know, you think, you know, people who think they're all that and that everything is so great, all it takes is some rebuking from the Lord to bring you down and to bring you low and to humble you. Don't let yourself get lifted up because pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And, and God will make sure to bring, in, especially as a child of God, God doesn't want you lifting up yourself. We allow ourselves to get into that mindset. It's going to happen. And you know what? It can just take, all it takes is some rebukes for iniquity. And, and, God can bring you down real fast. Verse number 12, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. And I think there's two ways of reading this verse. I was studying this verse and thinking about it. When he's saying, you know, because he's going on and on about receiving of the Lord for his iniquity and being rebuked and hear my prayer, give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears. And he's, at, he's just begging God to hear him, right? And then he says, For I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. And, uh, you know, you could either take this as him being distant from the Lord, right, hear me because I'm far away from you, I'm like a stranger to you, like you don't even know me, and, you know, I want to get closer to you. That's one way of reading this. I don't take it that way, though. I think he's, he's saying, For I'm a stranger with thee, 
meaning because I'm a stranger with thee as all my fathers were, that he's like a stranger in this world. If you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, this is referenced in Hebrews 11 when it goes through, uh, this is like the hall of faith, it's a faith chapter where it brings up all these great men of faith in scripture and basically explains that they're all strangers and pilgrims in this world. See, we don't want to be strangers from the Lord. We want to be well known with the Lord and well beloved of the Lord and, and, and have a great relationship with the Lord and good standing with the Lord. Right? We don't want to be to him like a foreigner. We want to be to him like a son. But with this world, we need to be like strangers. We want to be like strangers. We don't want to just fit right in and be of the world and just be like we're just in the family with the world. No, we're supposed to be living here like we're just foreign. Hey, we're just passing through. We're here on this earth. We're here in this world right now. Here we are. But you know what? This isn't, this isn't my home. I've got a home. I'm, I'm just passing the time here. This is temporary, right? So I'm not going to start amassing wealth and accumulating everything and hunkering down and building all these worldly foundations here and, and amassing all this wealth to, to have you know, my posterity have all this, this stuff. You know, it's vanity. Because this earth is going to be burnt up and all that is therein. Everything is going to be gone. We need to treat this as, it's just a short stay. That's right. Just sojourning. That's good. It's a trip. It's like a hotel. We're just kind of hanging out here for a little while and we're gone. And then we're going home. Amen. So the work that we do here, the mindset that we have here is focused on home. It's focused on amassing the rewards and the wealth that we could bring home with us. Because there's too much, th there's the things of the world you can't take with you. The wealth of the world, all the stuff that you could do in the world, you can't take any of that with you. But the heavenly things, you can. Souls, you can. People, you can. Hebrews 11.13, the Bible says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And I think this pleading in Psalm 39 is he saying, Lord, you know, I'm a stranger with you, right? Not meaning a stranger from you. I'm a stranger with you. And that's why, you know, what's, what solidifies it for me is he says, as all my fathers were. So he's kind of talking about this heritage, fathers of faith, like we see in Hebrews 11, where it brings up Abraham, it brings up Moses, it brings up these people of great faith. These are the fathers he's referring to. I mean, the psalmist here is saved. I believe it's a yeah, psalm of David, right? He's a, I mean, he's, he's praying unto the Lord and just saying, yeah, he knows he's sinned. And as we saw last week, you know, he's, he's sorry for his iniquity. And I know these aren't necessarily all in order or whatever is, is chronological, but it's the same humbleness, the same humility, the same attitude of not opening his mouth when he receives what's wrong saying, okay, I'm not going to say anything foolish now. And then just begging God, God, just hear me, right? Don't hold your peace in my tears. See my tears. See that I'm, I'm, I'm humble. I'm sorry. And I want to be with you. I'm a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. I'm not of this world, Lord. Just hear me and show mercy and, and forgive me. It's basically the heart that's going into Psalm 39. And then verse 13, he says, Oh, spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. So he's basically, you know, there's kind of a lot going on in this psalm, but just asking for God to, to help him out, right? Because he's, he's endured a lot, and he's saying, I just need to recover my strength so that I can continue. And, you know, even before I die, like, Lord, just allow me to, to get, get my bearing, get my strength before I, I leave and I am no more. And, um, you know, a lot of great truths here, but I, I think, you know, nothing is a coincidence as to why there's different subjects brought up. They're all tied together 
you know, and starting off with the, with the taking heed to your ways and, and really keeping track of your mouth and understanding we're here for a very short period of time and knowing that, you know, um, God will punish us and he'll rebuke us when we need it. Uh, but we need to act as if we're strangers in this world and that God will see us through and show us mercy and he will give us the strength that we need to continue. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great truths found in your word. God, I pray that you please help all of us um, to be able to control our tongues and to purpose ourselves that we won't sin with our mouths and to be able to um, take steps to make sure that we don't do those things. You know, whether it be on social media, Lord, that, that we you know, institute our own rules in our own lives that you either get off if you can't handle the, the you know, the social media or the, the, you know, putting yourselves in environments that, uh, that you're not good at, at, people aren't good at handling, Lord. Help us to be able to identify those areas. And um, if we want to continue putting ourselves in a, in a spot, Lord, help us to be able to, um, to manage that appropriately and, you know, make, make our own, you know, five second rule before you post something online or whatever that may be so that you could actually take a minute to think about what you're doing before doing it. Lord, there's so many ways that we can sin with our mouths and I pray that you would please help us and guide us to be able to put our own bridles and bits in our mouths to, to control ourselves and that you would um, also, Lord, just, just open up to us the areas where we're faulty, where we're, we're sinful and, and help us to be able to see those clearly so we don't blind ourselves to our own sins. And Lord, help us to be able to um, improve on those things and, and remember your words and remember the, the rebukes as well as the encouragement that we need to, to keep going forward. Lord, help us to have meaningful lives where we spend our time uh, not doing vain things, but where we can serve you uh, with the maximum amount of our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.